The United Nations says Palestinian women have borne the brunt of Israel's onslaught in Gaza. Two-thirds of those killed in a war purportedly against Hamas are women and children. Why are so many women victims and what can the world do to protect them? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Israel went to war in Gaza on the premise of destroying Hamas. Instead, in obliterating vast areas of the Gaza Strip, it's killed or maimed tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians and forced more than 1.8 million to flee. Many have no homes to return to as they have been destroyed by Israeli and Western supplied bombs. The United Nations says women and children have suffered the most in Israel's relentless bombardment. Combined, they make up nearly 70% of the dead. So what difficulties do Palestinian women face living under constant attack? And what's the world saying or doing about it? We'll be putting those questions and more to our guests in just a few minutes. But first, this report from Alexandra Bias. The mothers of Palestine's future are being wiped out. The UN says Israeli strikes kill two mothers every hour in Gaza, seven women every two hours, leaving Palestinian men and children to mourn the most fundamental figure in their lives. The women of Gaza hold their world together and give life to future generations, and they're suffering unprecedented tragedy. I am in the ninth month of pregnancy, and I was unable to walk with great difficulty until we reached Rafah. We saw death with our own eyes. We felt that we were dying and we had nothing. Life was very difficult. The UN says there are 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza. More than 5,000 are due to give birth within a month in unimaginable conditions. 180 women are delivering babies every day without water, without painkillers, without anesthesia for C-sections, without electricity for incubators, and without medical supplies. Yet, they continue to care for their children, for the sick, for the elderly, mixing baby formula with contaminated water when they find it, going without food so that their children can live another day. Day after day, women do what they can to keep their families safe, fleeing Israeli bombs on foot. It's the road that leads to death. It's like the apocalypse. It's difficult, very difficult. We walk and walk and walk. There are those who have lost sons and daughters, the wounded, pregnant women. Searching for shelter and salvaging food. Life is not normal. We are 127 people sleeping here in this room. Our husbands, brothers and sons are sleeping outside. All without any real hope for peace and nowhere near enough humanitarian aid. But day after day, they refuse to give up. This is not the first time it's been destroyed. It was demolished in 2008, in 2014 and now in 2023. And it will likely be demolished again but we will rebuild it again. So far, more than 4,000 Palestinian women have been killed by Israeli bombs, a number that's likely to rise. But in spite of these seemingly insurmountable odds, Palestinian women are determined to survive. Alexandra Byers for Inside Story. Well, let's now bring in our guests for today's show. In Ramallah, in the occupied West Bank, is Noor O'Day, a political analyst and former spokeswoman for the Palestinian Task Force on Public Diplomacy. In occupied East Jerusalem is Yara Hawari, senior analyst at Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and host of the Rethinking Palestine podcast. And in Cape Town, South Africa, is Heather Barr, associate director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. Ladies, welcome to your Thank you very much for joining us on Inside Story. Noor O'Day in Ramallah, let me start with you. Is Israel's war, you think, deliberately targeting Palestinian women? 
Thank you, Foley. I, I think Israel's war is deliberately targeting the fundamentals of life in Gaza. Uh, and in that sense, it, it, it would go without saying that it is targeting women and children and affecting them most adversely. When you see that entire neighborhoods have been wiped out, that the medical infrastructure of an entire society has been debilitated, has been uh, completely destroyed, the people who will feel that destruction uh, first and most will be the women uh, and children. Uh, the displacement will affect them the most. And so in a way, I think, yes, they are the primary targets because if the women can't handle all of that pain and all of that uh, agony, if they can't survive this war, that really the society itself can't because they're in, in Palestine in particular, and after so many years of oppression and occupation, they're the glue that mm. holds society together. It's the women who do right. that. And Noor, interestingly, and significantly, all women killed in this conflict in Gaza have come from all walks of life. They were journalists, they were UN workers, they were uh, healthcare workers as well. Absolutely. And, and that will have a long-term impact on everything, on all walks of life, on services, on uh, different professions, on the way the society will function even after the war is over. Nothing basically will be the same. Mm. Yara, let me get your thoughts. What do you think the impact of this war has been on Palestinians' uh, women's rights and dignity? Well, I, first and foremost, I think it's important to note the absence of Palestinian women in Gaza on this panel. For Palestinian women, there are different experiences of violence at the hands of the Israeli regime and for decades. Palestinian women in Gaza have been at the forefront of that violence. So only they can speak to that from a place of experience. Indeed, and we have but tried to, to reach Palestinian women in yes. Gaza, but you know there are connectivity issues as well, and it's been extremely difficult, but we have tried to, to, to reach out to them. Yes. I was just about to say that so many of them are not able to share um, you know, their experiences in this moment because communications are deliberately being limited um, and also because surviving the ongoing genocide is, is understandably taking precedence. And, you know, I think it's very difficult at this moment to get accurate figures on, on who's been killed, but we do know that at least 15,000 Palestinians um, have been killed and there are further 7,000 under the rubble. And of that 15,000, two-thirds are, are women and children, at least 6,000 children, um, and at least 4,000 and um, women and probably the same amount of men. And there is this tendency to put women and children in the same category. And I think it stems from the understanding that in war and conflict, they are the most vulnerable. Uh, and I think it's important to highlight that vulnerability. But I also think we have to give agency to Palestinian women. Um, and I think we have to be careful that we don't uh, depoliticize them. They are adults mm. and they are in their own category. Um, and I think, you know, inevitably um, in situations of conflict, in war, in genocide, because of existing patriarchal structures of gendered issues that disproportionately affect women, mm -hmm. um, I, I think women are going to be, you know, uh, disproportionately affected in, right. in, in, the, in the ongoing genocide in Gaza, which is incredibly, incredibly brutal, which is targeting, you know, residential buildings, which is targeting health services, which is even targeting UN shelters. Mm -hmm. So as Noor said, the Israeli regime is essentially targeting Palestinian life in Gaza, and inevitably uh, women will be a part of that. And, and Yara, you raise an important point, which I'll come back to, to Noor with in just a few minutes, the role of Palestinian women in Palestinian society and how they're viewed, Noor. But I want to bring Heather into the conversation uh, uh, first. Heather, uh, uh, Yara mentioned that in uh, war and conflict, and not just in Gaza, but around the world, very often it's the women and children that bear the brunt of the violence. Talk to us about the difficulties Palestinian women are facing currently in Gaza under constant attack and what the world is saying and doing about this. Well, you've covered a lot of this um, in the in the intro to this segment and, and the other speakers have as well. I mean, it's a it's an unspeakable situation for everyone, of course, but it affects women and girls in, in some specific ways. Um, obviously, the, the collapse of the healthcare system is is one clear area where, um, you know, it's it's pregnant women who are experiencing a crisis, but it's not only them. It's it's anyone who's trying to get 
regular health care, including sexual and reproductive health care, um, which is, is suddenly going to be unavailable to people. Um, it's, the, it's also about the role of women as caregivers, because, of course, we know that caregiving is very gendered. And so, um, you know, trying to find clean water to make formula for a baby um, is more likely to be the task of, of women than of men. Um, there are also a bunch of issues around sanitation and, and menstrual hygiene, um, and, and also issues about, um, you know, we know that in conflicts, one of the things that often happens is an escalation in sexual violence, and you're suddenly in an environment where any types of services and prevention will will not be functioning at all in this type right. of a crisis. Heather, is the plight of Palestinian women in Gaza right now, do you think it's registering strongly in, in uh, the Western world, in Western media? Why isn't there more noise made about the plight of, of Palestinian women right now? Well, you know, I think, um, as, as often happens, the, the situation, as it specifically relates to women and girls, gets drowned out by, by um, broader discussions of political issues. Um, I mean, one of the points that I think is really important is that 23 years ago, um, the Security Council passed Resolution 1325, which said that women are supposed to be full participants in all discussions about peace. Mm -hmm. And we see that all these years later, that's ignored all the time, even in processes led by the UN. And, and you see the consequences of that, I think, in a lot of places around the world. All right. Nor, let me come to you about the, this, uh, this issue. Uh, the Gaza war has certainly shown the centrality of, of women to the Palestinian cause, and we see this every day. Talk to us about the function and role of women in Palestinian society today and how they're viewed. Well, I think one of the things that uh, this war has uh, demonstrated and has uh, also ironically showed is the centrality of mm -hmm. women in Palestinian society. And it has humanized our men uh, for a change. It has shown our men and how attached they are to their mothers, to their wives, to their sisters, the fact that they can get emotional, that they can cry, that they grieve for the loss of those central figures in the family. Um, over, over the past decades and since the Nakba, Palestinian women have been uh, the heart and soul of the Palestinian people. They're the ones who were able to preserve our identity as a nation, to keep uh, uh, the, the um, not just the nation alive, but to keep generations of Palestinians knowing who they are, being proud of who they are, knowing where they come from, and also not succumbing to the dehumanization, to the denial of existence, to the systemic uh, um, um, attempts, political and violent and otherwise, of telling Palestinians not only that they don't have rights, but that they don't really exist as a nation. Without the women, mm. this would not have been possible. This is people who span and, and live all over the world and still share an identity. But, but no, I have... mean, isn't the reality, though, a bit more complicated in terms of political participation and decision-making for Palestinian women? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the many injustices that we face in this still traditional patriarchal society, that we are central and everybody understands that. But women still uh, have a very, um, I, I would say, you know, uh, steel ceiling uh, when it comes to political participation. There are icons mm -hmm. of Palestinian uh, politics and resistance who are women. But really, when it comes to decision making, when it comes to the so-called Palestinian leadership, it is basically a room full of older men, and women are excluded. Um, you know, regardless of of how effective they are, of how respected they are, or they could be in their own community. So those problems still persist, and we are a long way from achieving what we want as women okay. in society in terms of political participation. But I think socially and emotionally, um, during this war, and, 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 and once before, maybe because this war was, this is an especially brutal war, the centrality of women in families and in, in society in general has taken central stage because so many were lost. And yep. with them, the, the balance of a family, of a, of a whole community. Y Yara, your thoughts about what Noor said there and, and what do you think the role and function of Palestinian women is, not just 
you know, in times of conflicts, but in these last 70 plus years of occupation, what has, what, how are they viewed within the Palestinian uh, society and the communities they live in? Well, Palestinian women have long been politicized individuals and agents, not just as wives, sisters or mothers, uh, but also as, as fighters, as, as political organizers, as leaders with, with agency that isn't defined by their relationship to men. And, and not only as, you know, these reproductive bodies, you know, looking back at throughout Palestinian history, Palestinian women have always been present and active at crucial political and, and national moments. Uh, and they've con constantly had to navigate, you know, all these various tensions between feminism, nationalism and, and mm. anti-colonial struggle. And that hasn't stopped. That's been a continuous process um, of, of existence uh, and resistance within within that colonial context. Um, and I think, you know, hearing from 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 colleagues and and friends on the ground in Gaza, you know, they're really continuing that that legacy. Um, women often, you know, bear the brunt in globally um, when it when it comes to situations of of genocide uh, and of war. Um, and in Palestine, that's no different. And in Gaza, you know, where there is basically no food, no clean water, um, the threat of bombardment looming, um, you know, basic life chores are, are, are nearly impossible. Mm. Uh, and so it, it's the women that really are, are bearing the, the brunt of, of, of keeping their, their families alive, keeping their children warm, keeping uh, the sick and injured, uh, uh, making sure that they're taken care of. Um, and surviving in these kinds of conditions is, is unbelievably difficult and, yeah. and no one should be forced to, to live in these kinds of conditions. Yeah, Heather, may, maybe your thoughts about this. You know, we, we talked about the war in Gaza right now, but there's also been 70, 75 plus years of, of occupation. What has that meant for Palestinian women? The impact of, of the occupation on, on Palestinian women's legal, their social, their economic and, and political status, whether in Gaza or the occupied West Bank? No, it's, I mean, absolutely. And, and my organization has written a lot about um, the impact of the blockade over the years um, on the people in Gaza. And, and of course, that, like this conflict, will have had a disproportionate impact on women and girls. And, and you know, it's it's important to recognize the leadership that they've been able to to provide in spite of that, but but no one should have to face those kinds of challenges. Um, and, and one of the things that's striking to me, you know, watching from a distance and, and trying to learn about um, the, the activism that's happened, mm -hmm. um, calling for peace in, in Palestine and Israel is about how much that's been led by women and how, you know, there have been some, some powerful organizations that have brought together women um, from both sides to, to right. call for peace in spite of the fact that they keep being excluded from these high-level discussions. But what about Western feminists, uh, Heather? You know, uh, uh, um, Yara mentioned feminism there. And, and Western feminism seems to tie women's activism to certain rules and frameworks. Why is the struggle of, of Palestinian women in much of the West, unseen above the image of, of the weeping mother, you know, the, the victim and so on. Why are, are the struggles of non-Western societies not considered uh, as part of the women's struggle? Well, I mean, feminism is a work in progress, like like everything else. And there have been a lot of powerful critiques in, in recent, recent years of, of what people call white feminism. And, mm. and those critiques are pretty valid. And I would just say that Palestinian women are not the only ones feeling neglected by, by Western or white feminism. Um, and I think there's a lot of work that, um, that some of the women's rights activists who have more access to the corridors of power in, in Washington or in Europe can do to be in solidarity with women in other parts of the world, including Palestine. Okay, Noor, perhaps you, you want to add uh, to that, the, the, the way Western, you know, feminism perhaps neglects the issue of, of Palestinian women. Yeah, and I, I think it's very noteworthy. We've seen a lot of, um, a lot of protests, a lot of solidarity with the Palestinians, but there are some groups that were missing. Mm. Um, and there are some, uh, you know, um, uh, noteworthy, uh, I think, absences, including the uh, tying women's struggle and feminist uh, uh, goals with what, what is happening with what Palestinian women are enduring, including solidarity with Palestinian journalists, and many of whom are women. They've done an amazing job. They're enduring 
the unbearable and they're braving very, very dangerous conditions. And yet, I didn't see enough right. of that uh, solidarity. But it is, you know, as your guest said, it, it is unfortunately um, something that is not new. It is a sign of so-called white feminism. And I think we need to more and more elevate the voices of uh, the of feminists in the South, so to speak, that does not perhaps fit in the box right. of mainstream feminism. And it needs to be accepted for what it is rather than be made something else. Yara, your thoughts about this, your, your thoughts about, you know, what makes Gaza's women invisible in, in, in the eyes of Western feminists, perhaps? Well, I think it's, first and foremost, I think it's important to clarify, because I don't want there to be a misunderstanding, yeah. that the majority of Palestinian women are not calling for peace. They are calling for justice and for right. an end to colonial occupation. And the majority of Palestinian women view their struggle through that anti-colonial lens. And I think that misrepresentation of Palestinian women is another consequence of white feminism, which, which inevitably depoliticizes uh, Palestinian women. And we are seeing that, again, um, through the narratives on women in Gaza, where we talk about the humanitarian situation, which is incredibly dire. But that focus on the humanitarian situation without putting it in its correct political context, which is one of uh, colonial occupation, of Israeli colonial occupation, does a disservice not only to Palestinian women, um, but to, to feminism uh, and to women in, in the global south. And I think it's incredibly important to emphasize that what's happening in Gaza isn't inevitable. You know, mm. we are looking at political actions and decisions that are forcing Palestinian Palestinians in Gaza, including Palestinian women, into these conditions. You know, this literally could end tomorrow if there was the political will to do so. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have that political will because Palestinians, including Palestinian women, have been dehumanized for so yeah. long um, that there is limited will to, to stop, to take a stand against the Israeli regime from continuing this genocide. All right. Heather, Yara said there are political actions and decisions that have, that have an impact on, on women in Gaza. But this is, again, happening in conflicts around the world, women bearing the brunt of the violence, but at the same time being excluded from the political process. How do we change that? How do we protect these women in these conflict zones and make sure that they are part of, of the political uh, decision-making process? Thanks. I mean, first, I, I just want to I want to thank you, Yara, for your comments and that clarification. And I'm sorry if it sounded like I was I was saying something different. Um, um, yeah, I think it's a it's a very hard question to answer about mm. how we change this. I think that um, lifting up women leaders is is one way to do that. If we had more women in key political positions around the world, I think that that would make some difference. Although, of course, we know that um, being a feminist and being a, a woman leader are not always the same thing. Um, I think trying to make bodies like the UN um, follow their own words and and do keep the promises that they've made. Um, and reminding them of that again and again, and 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 lifting up the voices of women um, from countries that are experiencing conflict, from countries where um, you know you're seeing women being disproportionately killed, um, bringing their voices actually to places like the Security Council and hearing from them directly is something powerful that that I know there are people working to do, but it doesn't happen enough, and there isn't enough space. All right, uh, Noor Oday in Ramallah. Palestinian women, as we've heard and said during this conversation, are not just victims. They are central to the Palestinian cause. And the existence mm -hmm. of, of the Palestinian people, as you said yourself, rests on them. So what should the international community be doing and what should the Palestinian people be doing to protect these women? Well, I think right now the international community should be doing the bare minimum, which is to get a ceasefire, to end... Uh, this aggression and to um, uh, find a way that uh, has a political horizon that meets the aspirations of Palestinians. Um, and I regrettably don't see that um, materializing at the moment. I don't see that um, being in the offing uh, or in the discussions, unfortunately. Not yet, anyways. But for Palestinians, I think that in terms of protection, regrettably, I don't think there's a lot that can be done. Part of the reason why so many women are dying 
in one strike, for example, is because so many are displaced. And as we saw in the report at the beginning, the women stay in one place to kind of give them some space and some privacy while the men either stay in the right. hall or outside or in the yard of the of the school shelter. So mm. when when there is a strike, they they go in groups, they go mm. and, and basically with them entire family. So I, I, it breaks my heart to say this, but, I, you know, there is just no no safe place for physical safety in Gaza. But a lot can be done. Once this war is done, a lot can be done to elevate women. And, and part of it has to do with us Palestinian women learning how to work with one another and how to respect, uh, you know, the version of feminism we ascribe to, because there are so many different shades and colors of that. And I think one of the most interesting components, perhaps, and, and the most recent relatively, is the uh, uh, women who uh, hail from more conservative, more uh, religious uh, political groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad who are mm -hmm. and, or who consider themselves to be feminists. They need to have an active role in collaborating with other feminist leaders to speak about it, to elevate female voices and to make sure that women are part, not just of the overall, uh, you know, social fabric, but part of the political conversation and the decision making. And and that when it comes time to for those big uh, uh, conversation, for, for those big discussions, women women are not kept outside of the room. Uh, we can do that if there is that camaraderie, so to speak, between women coming from different uh, political affiliations and different uh, social uh, um, ideologies, whether it's progressive or conservative. Mm -hmm. All right, Yara, I think I'll give you the last word. What, Yara, do you think should be done to protect and empower Palestinian women? I think, you know, in the immediate term, there has to be a ceasefire. Uh, so that, you know, Palestinians in Gaza are no longer, you know, facing bombardment. Um, and with a ceasefire, obviously, you know, the bombs will stop and, and maybe the siege will be lifted. Um, but it doesn't stop there because Palestinians will still not be free. And I think this terrible moment that we're experiencing now is also a pivotal one for the Palestinian struggle. I think it necessitates an insistence um, that this colonial occupation uh, can no longer continue. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, I think Palestinians across the world um, are, are gaining solidarity among other groups. I think there is a connection, um, uh, solidarity connections that is unprecedented, including among feminist groups. And amidst all of this, this horror and amidst this ongoing genocide, I think that is one of the few uh, areas of optimism and hope that we can see where this interconnectedness, these solidarity networks are recognizing that, that Palestine is, is pivotal to the politics of liberation uh, and to a fairer, a, a more just world. Ladies, thank you very much for a very important conversation, an insightful discussion. Thank you, Noor O'Day, Yara Hawari, Heather Barr. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, too, for joining us and for watching this program. You can uh, watch it again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.